Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Let me do it one more time. Good. Good. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. That's right. We're broadcasting all the wolves tonight. Good evening. We're going to be bringing in our friend from the remote parts of Canada. Oh. All right. I want to thank the wolves. No, no wolves were harmed in the creation of this sound effect. Um, I want to welcome everyone to a Friday night, Friday night with the Quarantine Concert Series. I'm your host, Kabir Segal. This is show number 41 in 30 days. We have, I was just looking at the math. 1.5 million views across all the videos. Almost all the musicians are, are they were trying to feature, you know, we're trying to mix in established and emerging artists. So thank you so much for being a part of this broadcast. We are with you every single night at 10 p.m. Eastern. We're religious, so you can count on the sun going up, going down, and the show going to be on the air. We're going to keep doing this as long as we can. I'm coming to you live from my parents' place in Atlanta, you know what? I keep saying every night that they're sleeping, but my mom said something to me yesterday. She said, you know, I watched you last night. And I was like, oh, you watched us last night? Because, and then she knew exactly what was happening on the broadcast. And she's under strict orders because the internet flickers. So if you see my internet flickering, hi, mom. Thanks for watching. And, uh, but I love them. And it's so great to be here with them during this extended time. So let me just tell you what we're doing. Many of you know what we're doing already, but if this is your first time, you know we're going through an international emergency. It's a pandemic. All the gigs have been canceled. All the uh, concerts have gone away. And the live music space has really been under duress. It's the artists. It's also everyone involved in those concerts. It's the managers and bookers and promoters and bands and engineers and producers. So my heart goes out to so many of these people, so many of my friends. And uh, the gigs have been canceled. I've even seen some indication that gigs are canceled throughout the rest of the year. And so this is a multi-billion dollar, one estimate was a $9 billion impact to the concert, live concert industry. So um, I started this concert series in earnest and to put the spotlight back on the people who deserve it the most, the artists, they're with us, sharing us, sharing with us their hearts and their energies and their you know minds and uh, souls with us throughout the year. And uh, that we really need them to help lift our spirits. So that's what this broadcast is all about, putting a spotlight back on the incredible artists and the virtuosos who join us every single night. So that's what's up. That's the philosophy of the show, trying to support artists. And if you know an artist or someone in the live event space, reach out to them, give them some love, um, buy their CDs, subscribe to them. You know what to do. All right. So that's what we're doing. Uh, I want to thank our partners, All About Jazz, the most comprehensive jazz resource in earth and it started in 1995 by michael ritchie uh this website does everything about jazz if you're an artist go there claim your page or create an artist page if you're a patron donate to them um, you can find out they're covering unfortunately and we're going to be, be talking about it tonight a lot of people in the jazz community have been affected by this uh, terrible pandemic and they cover the folks all about jazz cover some of the sad stories and the, you know all the people were kind of losing and they're doing tributes to some of the, the leading legends who are who are losing us or who are who, who are leaving us and so check out all about jazz to get an update on how the jazz community is coping with this uh, global pandemic all right so that's them i also want to uh, explain where we broadcasting uh, the short answer is everywhere we're on uh, the facebook we are also on the twitter we're also on the very delicious, very delicious. I mean, I mean, it's one of my favorite things to eat um, this time of night. The Instagram cracker. It goes nice with marshmallows. You can make a s'more out of it. So if you're at a campfire, turn on your Instagram crackers, and it'll be delicious to watch. All right, and we're also on the LinkedIn. A lot of people have lost their jobs. If you're searching for a job on LinkedIn right now, I'm sorry to interrupt your search, but you need the music, right? So I hope you enjoy the broadcast and get back to your search later. We're also on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe everywhere you get updated on where to find the broadcast. All right, if you're next thing, if you're an artist who wants to get on the show, uh, please let me know on Facebook or Instagram. We are trying to work through our waiting list. We have about 70 artists, 70 artists on the waiting list. 
So thank you for your patience as we move through this as thoughtfully and as responsible. A lot of friends trying to hit me up. I'm going to try to get you on the show, but please bear with me. All right. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we, and uh, that is the public service announcements. And now we get to the best part of the show, the best part of the show, where we get to go out to Canada and uh, meet the incredible artist, the incredible virtuoso out in Canada. No, I'm just kidding. And, uh, <laughs> and uh you know, I've known about this artist for years, and I've been a big fan, and I've listened to so many of her albums. They're like almost, I want to even say biblical creations, because we all learn her music. We all study her music in this space. And um, I think many of you know who she is. She creates art at the highest level, fantastic productions, first-class engineer, conceptual artist, composer, arranger, multi-instrumentalist. It is a great delight to welcome to the show the great Jane Bonnet. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be on the show, and th congratulations, and thank you for doing this. It's a great service to we artists. Thank you. Every night, it's incredible you're doing this every night. Well, th thank <laughs> thank you. Um, it's become part of the, the battle rhythm every day for us, so I so appreciate you for joining us. You're in, tell us where you are right now. I'm on Lake St. Peter, which is um, in nor not northern northern Ontario, but I'm just we're just outside of a, a big national park, which is called Algonquin Park, one of the biggest parks in Canada, provincial park. Um, and uh, I'm up at uh, the cabins that my grandfather uh, built. He, he came up here in 1919. He was one of the first kind of pioneers, actually, and uh, he loved to hunt and fish. Uh, not so much hunt, but fish. And um, he came up and he bought some property on a handshake with a farmer up here. And it's hard to believe it's farmland because it's so much, so much woods and pines and everything now. But anyway, um, he bought the property then, and then he started building in the late twenties one cabin for he and his wife. And then he bought a little. Uh, then he built another cabin, chopping the trees down on this property um, for his children. And I came up with my mother because she'd come up here as a child and um, I'd come up here all my life for a few years. It was out, um, it was on, up for sale. And so we didn't have access to it at that time. But luckily my husband, Larry Kramer, uh, and I were able to um, acquire it. We worked out a settlement with, with uh, the person who bought it in 1995 and we bought it back. So that's where I am. I'm, in, I'm out in the middle of the woods by a lake. The ice is melting right now. We're just watching the water slowly <laughs> come in. And I think in a couple of days, all the ice will be gone. But we still got a lot of snow. And, and, and for the record, there are wolves out there, right? There are wolves. Oh, yeah. You can you can hear them. I mean, not right now because they're sort of packed out somewhere. But you can hear them howling sometimes at night. You know, one starts and then they all get going. <laughs> Yeah. Tell me, how has the pandemic affected you? What gigs have you had to cancel that you had planned? I want people to get a sense of yeah. your your career and what you were about to do. Yes. Well, anyway, um, I don't know if people are familiar with how we we work. My, my group is called Makeke, and I, it's an all-female ensemble. We're just in our fifth year now. I've had a group with my husband called Spirits of Havana. Larry's a trumpet player, producer. And uh, we've had a group for about 30 years. And many great musicians have come through it. Daphne Prieto, Pedrito Martinez, Alario Duran, uh, Elio Villafranca, so many names. But um, about five years ago, I, I felt there wasn't enough um, uh, opportunities for women in Cuba. So I... Um, formed this group. It was kind of a, just a one-off project. And, um, but we, we went down there. I picked the girls out that I wanted to have in the group with, along with uh, Dainia Rosena, wonderful uh, Afro-Cuban vocalist. Put the group together, made our first recording, and it worked out like very, very well. So anyway, we then, we formed ourselves uh, five years ago and then we, I brought the group to Canada and we did some touring around Canada. And then the next big thing was to try and get into the United States. So the way that we work is that we have to petition to, to enter the States because the girls are on uh, passports, Cuban passports. They still live in Cuba. 
And um, we have to petition the State Department to, to come to the U.S. So we line up our dates for a year. And uh, that's a lot of work, you know, to, to work with the agents and set all that work up. And then we put the work with the lawyer and the petition goes into the State Department. Anyhow, we've been doing this for about four, five years now. This year, um, it was touch and go. We brought the girls uh, three and a half weeks ago. I guess it's a month actually now. Brought them from Cuba. They were living. Normally, the procedure is they come, they live in the house, um, they go to get their do their visas. Um, they have an appointment where they have an interview. We do the petition. The petition gets approved, and then they come to Toronto, Canada, to go to the embassy because there's no U.S. Um, embassy in Cuba anymore. And um, we wait. And so in that time frame, that's where we rehearse and do all the, you know, work on the music. And we wait to get the okay to come to the embassy, to get the visas, then to enter. So um, close to a month ago, we were waiting and waiting, and that was touch and go. We were pretty stressed out. The girls were all bouncing off the walls, you know, well, are we going to get the visas? Because we were supposed to be, two and a half weeks ago, we were actually supposed to be in Atlanta. We were supposed to be at Emory College. I had doing a residency there. Anyhow, um, so we got the visas, but the day after the COVID, everything hit and everything was canceled. We got the visas. So we're good to go for the next year. <laughs> um, apparently, like we had a lot of we had a lot of tours in the next few months of the United States. Plus, we were going to Europe, a very extensive uh, European tour. And luckily, everything's getting now moved, hopefully, to the fall, to September, October, November. So um, I'm just hoping, you know, we'll see what happens. But we're good to go for the next year. And, and it, all, it all depends. But the girls, it was crazy because when we, find, when we got the passports back from the uh, U.S. Embassy, um, we got them on the last plane back to Cuba. An Air Canada flight back to Cuba. They were yeah. all of ten people on the plane. Wow! So they're all in Cuba right now, and um, they're dealing with their own Good. first issue in Cuba. Yeah. No, it's, it's an incredible project, and it's an incredible band that you've put together. And uh, you know, we've all followed yes. you so closely, uh, the artistry and the virtuosity. What would you like to begin your performance with tonight? Well, I would like to. I guess I would like to do this piece because it's one of the first things, um, one of the first Cuban pieces that I learned, it's from the Afro-Cuban literature, musical literature. It, uh, it's a folkloric piece, so it's uh, it dates back hundreds of years. It's called Osain, and it's um, normally it's just performed as a chant with drummers and singers. A call, it has a call and response. Osain um, is one of the deities. There's many deities in the Afro-Cuban religion, and this is... Um, the deity or the saint um, that is for Mother Nature. So bringing us the herbs for healing um, the earth and all the, the beautiful things that are in nature and being out here in nature right now, um, it's, I think it's a good start. So I'll, I'll play this. It's, we recorded it on our Rhythm and Soul uh, recording. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, yes, yeah, right. All right. <laughs> so good. So good. And then a shout, shout out to you and a shout out to Larry, who's in the room. <laughs> Thank you. That sounded so good. That sounded so good. Um, I have some questions. I'll just read them as they as they come in. Some people want to know how many instruments do you play? They see a couple there. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I love playing all kinds of instruments, but I mean, piano and woodwinds. That's really yeah, piano and woodwinds and marimba. Um, which which woodwinds? You play the flute, right? Do you play clarinet at all? I had a clarinet. I started on clarinet. I started on in the school band in grade five and six. Um, I think I think clarinet is an incredible gateway instrument um, for the saxophone because clarinet is really a very difficult uh, instrument. And if you can master the clarinet, saxophones, <laughs> it comes a little bit more, you know, easily the the technique. There's other, of course, challenges with the saxophone, but. Clarinet's a really tricky one, but I played the clarinet for about four years, mm -hmm. and um, and then I was sent to a private school, and it was a school instrument, and I didn't play music for quite a while after that. Got it, got it. I always get this question early in the show. People want to know what kind of saxophone do you have, and do you like to play? Yeah, well, um, it's a Selmer. Um, it's it's a funny story because um, I I bought this instrument actually after hearing. Steve Lacey on a recording, and I just, I, I loved, I heard Steve Lacey actually before I heard Coltrane, and um, I just love the, the mysterious sound of it, and uh, I was in my first um, year, I didn't finish the year at university, but I was in my first few months, and I fell, and I, and I broke my ankle at the, on the university portable stairs, because the, the stairs were like slippery, they had moss on it, and there was no overhang to kind of keep that from happening anyway I was hobbling around on crutches and um um crutches and uh, this cast and uh somebody who worked in administration saw me going from you know campus to different places and I said ah oh, poor you you know well, how'd you do that I said I fell on the portable stairs she said well you know what you could go into the administrative department you could get some money for that an out-of-court settlement I went, oh really so that's what I did, and uh, I bought my saxophone for, I think it was $726. <laughs> so wow. That's my only saxophone I have. It's a Mark VI, and um, I have a tenor, but that, that's, my, that's my main horn, the only one I've ever had. Yeah, it's a, a beautiful. Uh, we have a lot of, of, of uh, fans, one saying, Alex, saying, great to see Jane on the series, so many memorable concerts she performed with musicians such as Dewey Redman, Don Pullen, Gonzalo Rubalcaba, many, many artists. So, so many folks are familiar with your incredible collaborations. Is there someone that's out there in the, let's call it the Latin jazz universe, that you have not collaborated with that you think you would like to at some point? Wow. Oh, wow. <clears throat> well, um, you know, I am a. Uh... A huge Miguel Zanon fan, <laughs> but you know Who's what not? he's doing is, is so incredible. Yeah. Um, but I just, I, I just lo I truly love him. I mean, a lot of the people that I love, I have had a chance to play with that Daniel Torres. Yeah. Um, absolutely, you know, brilliant musician. Um, Daphne's, I've had a, a that's great. I've had a you know chance he used to play with me and. Yeah. Uh, Elio Franca and wow, just let me think. Played with John Benitez. Who can I think with? There are a lot of good ones out there. Um, there are really, there's so <laughs> many, there's so many yeah. musicians. What would you like yeah. to play for us next? Um, I like to do this piece um, because I never want to forget this amazing musician, Don Pullen. Um, I had the opportunity, I, I would say he was. Uh, very, he became a very dear friend to both Larry and I. Uh, we got a chance to, I recorded four records with Don, and he really became a mentor to me. And um, he was one of the reasons I got into jazz. I told him that, and he said, don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always laugh at that story, but I heard him um, uh, with Mingus's group. Uh, I mean, I, I, I heard some other things with him, but 
Yeah, the, it, it was a timing thing. I, I was playing classical piano for quite a while and, and um, I had a hand injury and I went to San Francisco to just get away from the piano for a while. This is like 1976, I think it would be. And um, Megas' group was playing Keystone Corners in San Francisco. And I went one night and I went second night and I went a third night. I went every single night, George Adams, Don Poole and Jack Walrath, Danny Richmond, of course, Megas. And when I came back from that trip, that was the trip that I really, uh, I decided I really, I wanted to be a jazz musician. I didn't have a clue how to go about doing it. There was no music, you know, jazz study programs at that time. And, uh, and I just had all the you know, stigmas that I wasn't the, the, the stereotype of what a jazz musician is supposed to be. But I really wanted to do it. And um, anyhow, um, proceed, you know, pursued it later, later on. But it was a really um, pivotal time for me. And um, the fact that I got later that, to record with Don on my very first recording called In Due Time, Don Poland and Dewey Redman, both on my first LP, and uh, I recorded this piece, Big Alice, and this became a you know a piece that he played not only with his own group with George Adams, but with Mingus, and and um, it, it's almost like a you know a standard for people that are in the know of how great Poland was. So, and this is the one with the the clave. This is the one. Bump, 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 bump. Kind of a New Orleans thing, you know. You got to step here? I'm back. <laughs> Good. We'll need it. Good. Oh, there's that delay. It's called yeah, the exactly. delayed clapping. <laughs> <laughs> you go. Uh, 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 uh. Got it? Uh, 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 uh. uh, uh. Clave now. They're doing it all, all together. Is that the wolves or the cloud or the fan? <laughs> this is Atlanta. Atlanta loves you, Jane. Atlanta loves you, Larry. Yeah. Wow. I remember. We want Jane and Larry. We want Jane and Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amir, you pay royalties for that applause? Thank Can't you, hear you, Larry. Can't hear you. you Can't hear you. They love you too much. You guys need to settle down. Set, settle down. Oh, you keep going. 
That was really good. We're trying we're trying to make up for all those lost gigs right now. Exactly. <laughs> Clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. <laughs> See, they all stop yeah. together. They can count. Yeah, that's good. We've well, got con complete control of them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, well, that was <laughs> awesome. I want uh, to learn more. I want to learn more. You have over 20 releases. We don't have time to talk about all of them, unfortunately, but we have time to talk about your recent one. On sure. Firm Ground. Did you feel like you were on unfirm ground before this album? Yes, I did. Uh, you know, um, when we put the group together, everybody was at, you know, very different levels. And um, the personalities in the group, um, you know, I went down to Cuba and I sort of checked out the people that, the, the players that I thought would be, um, you know, the right personality for the kind of thing that I was trying to do. I mean, they, number one, they had to have a desire to play jazz. And they were not all at the same level of playing jazz. Um, a couple of them very inexperienced, but really, really talented. And Larry and I could recognize that talent very quickly. And that's the amazing thing about Cuban musicians. Um, number one, they, they get such wonderful training. And they really have the music, you know, deep, really deep inside them. And the music is so important in Cuba. It's what really connects everybody together. So um, those two things are very natural for the musicians to have. But at the same time, they need to have, they needed to have the desire to play jazz because ultimately I am a jazz musician. That's what I love most. I love the jazz musicians. I love improvising. I love the fact that you never do the same thing twice and that, you know, you're trying to constantly challenge yourself and come up with something different. And um, so that was a very important element. And so uh, at first, you know, it was like nurturing a, a, like a, a, a newborn baby. It was like, how is this going to work? And, um, you know, we didn't even really know each other as people. Um, and that quickly changed because of the situation that, that, that um, is set up for our, the way that I have to tour. The group has to come to, yeah. to, to, to live in, in, in Toronto. And... Um, and, um, and while well, we work on the visas, and uh, I have a very important band member, um, our pianist, Dan Ilano, who's one of a wonderful classical piano player and now has become a, a fantastic uh, jazz player and composer. But she really, uh, you know, she helps me with the, with the lawyer, with the visas and setting up appointments. It's something, it's all so much, you know, finding the work, taking care of, you know, the contracts and all, booking the flights and booking the hotels. But, you know, you can't, you can't do any of that stuff unless you get the visas for the band. And she is really, she's been my, my right arm and my left arm. And um, so anyway, we have grown together as a group um, through five years of very, very hard work. And, and a lot of, you know, sometimes some very distressing moments when, we don't know if we're going to make the gig, if, you know, if we're going to get the visas, if this is going to happen, and all the things that come up um, with our particular issues of having a band that's living in another country. And, of course, Cubans on, that, on their passports, it, 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 you know, then they're not exactly, it's a very tricky travel, travel issues with that. We're always running into this stuff. But anyway, so um, I felt like, you know, now... Uh, the last year we got a Grammy nomination for Odara and I felt like, wow, you know what? The band is really starting to hit it now. We're really sounding good. We're really working as a unit. The girls, you know, when they hit the stage, they're just like, they have this joy and happiness and just 
can't wait to get out there and show everybody, you know, what they can do because they're all playing so fantastically. And I think, like, I'm just so proud of the group of how we sound. So on firm ground, it just was like, yeah, you know, we're really, we've really dug our roots in and we're strong and we're like strong trees and we're just going to go out there and just keep doing it. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Yeah. I, I listened to it today. What a beautiful project. Um, would, you. would you like to play something? What would you like to play next? Are you going to play anything from this record? Yeah, would you like me? I can play the, that piece on Firm Ground. Oh, oh, I love it. Yeah. This is by um, Dan Orlando. I wrote the lyrics for it. Okay. But I won't sing. No, 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 no. Will, will Larry sing? Hopefully Dan is watching. I'm not sure if she is, but All right. anyway. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. That was very moving. Very moving. Very moving. We have a lot of love. I'll put some on the screen. You're getting a lot of hearts and smiley faces on Twitter and <laughs> on Instagram. I have a question on Instagram. Bruce says he's studying to be, he's studying music right now in college. What advice do you have? For, he's, he's playing the saxophone. What advice do you have uh, to someone in college who wants to be a professional saxophonist? Well, well, there's so many things I would say. First of all, just to listen to as many 
of course, saxophone players as you can, horn players, as much jazz as you can, listen to the greats, you know, it's every, it, what everybody told me, and it's, it sure rings true, listen to the greats, the Charlie Parkers, the Coltrane's, the Lester Young's, the Coleman Hawkins, the, et cetera. Of course, the great Lee Konitz, who unfortunately we just lost. I mean, he had one of the most unique players, a whole other, a whole other uh, realm of playing, you know, just like so unique. And um, I, I mean, I think if you, you decide that you, you want to go out and, and be a jazz artist on your instrument, um, one of the most important things is to, um, besides listening to all the people that, that, that are so important to hear, is to start to think about um, your style and how you want to sound like you and how do you go about sounding like you. One of the first things is just working on your sound and just getting the best sound you can on the instrument. I mean, I, I learned that from so many of the players that I, you know, gravitated towards Clifford Jordan and Steve Lacey and uh, a long list of, of, of horn players. Um, but they all had like, you know, just within just a few notes, you would know uh, that it was them. And it was like a singer, like, why do we, why would we hear singers why are so many singers so distinct, you know, in the era of the Sarah Vaughns and Elvis Gerald's yeah. and Herman Craze? They were all so distinct and nobody sounded like each other. Sheila Jordan, none of those people sounded like each other. They all, like, from the get-go, you know, developed their own thing. And I, and I think if you want to be an artist, that's what you've got to do. You can't, you can't copycat somebody else and um, copy this style because everyone's going to just say you're a copycat. So you've got to try and be, be unique, and um, that takes time. And my other advice is, um, and it's hard, but to try and have fun with the journey of music. I mean, that's the biggest lesson that I, I have learned, and that's the, the biggest treasure that I have, is that all the musicians that I've met along the way, and there's such a long list. Um, there are so many musicians that uh, if they came to Toronto to play at one of the clubs, I would go out to hear them, and I would, after they finished playing, if it was on the break or after the show, I'd say, do you have time tomorrow afternoon? Could you give me a lesson? And so I learned firsthand for people like James Moody and Frank West and Clifford Jordan, um, hanging out with these people, hanging out with these great artists and learning to play, you know, like just being rubbing, rubbing shoulders with them. It's like, it's such a treasure to, to have had that. And so yeah. you got to really enjoy, you know, enjoy the ride. Like I think a lot of people now, and you can't, you can't blame musicians, but they're like all about business and they really quickly want to like, oh, should I get a publicist and should I do this and should I do that? And that's sort of the, the fast track of how it's been but you know when I was starting to play it, it was sometimes I got impatient but I had so much fun I mean hanging up with some Slim Gaylord like you know I hung out with historical people that were like in the music and their vibes and their energy and the music gave me the essence of what you need to be to be a musician and to be in the music and to be amongst musicians and 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 just work together you know it's that's my advice I hope it's good advice good advice sounds like <laughs> you should write a book because i'm sure you have so many stories to tell and and uh yeah you, you have a lot of, <laughs> i'm sure you do uh what would you like to perform next Maybe I'll do something, I, I'll do a Cuban thing, another okay. Cuban thing. Maybe I'll do this one on more porté. Um, Cuba has been like a huge part of my musical uh, journey. Uh, I made two records that were more, you know, mainstream records before I got into the Cuban thing. And um, I went in 1982, my, our first trip to Cuba. And that was, you know, very exciting. And I had no, had no idea. Um, 
of all the music that I had no idea. The moment I got there, there was just music in the airport, got outside the airport, there was another band, and I got on the bus, got to our tourist destination, there was another group playing, it was Afro-Cuban group, totally different music again, and then that night, song on Tuno group, which was just, uh, it was just so spectacular and, and um, earth shaking. I mean, I would just say it was an 18-piece band. There was more people in the band than there was in, a, in the hotel. It was like about eight people in the hotel. It was a brand new hotel. And um, this song on Tuno group was just roaring. So that, I was, you know, hit by the bug on that first trip and came back to Toronto and three weeks later went again back to Cuba, but then to Havana. First trip was Santiago to Cuba, then to Havana. When I got to Havana, when Larry and I got there, we got to meet the great Mercedes Valdez and her husband, Guillermo Barreto. Mercedes was one of the greatest um, uh, interpreters of the Afro-Cuban music and also popular music. And her husband was one of the Cuban greats, jazz drummers, um, playing with Nat King Cole and you name it, at all the top clubs in Cuba. So between those two, they interested introduced us to a who's who of Cuba over the years. And then we finally, um, we made a, a record in 1990 called Spirits of Havana. And then we did a lot of work with, with Mercedes and many things. And then we made this recording, Gemma Longo, and recorded this piece, Amor Porte, which is a Italian bolero. And we just did it, Mercedes, Catalines, and myself. And um, we did it in the style of a rumba, Um So the very particular rhythm, but I'll have the rhythm in my head. So I hope it, I hope it's interpreted. Okay. <laughs> So good. So good. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Thank you. Very emotive and soulful. Right from the bedroom. <laughs> Live in the bedroom. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you mentioned Lee Konitz. Um, what do you have? Do you have any like recollections of him or 
How did yeah. he shape? How did he shape the saxophone world? And and for those of you who don't wow. know, sorry, Lee Konis passed away recently um, because of this terrible this terrible virus. Um, it's very sad how the virus is affecting our our jazz and creative community. But we obviously want to dedicate the show to him yes. and tribute to him. Go ahead. Yes, all, all the older musicians. It's just like just dreadful. Um, well, Lee Konitz came to Toronto a lot. Um, so when I first started getting into jazz, we had a club that was called Basin Street, Bourbon Street, a two-story club on one of the main drags. And um, it was like, you know, the days where we had five, six nights of jazz with a, sometimes a matinee on Saturday. Um, and Lee Konitz came quite a bit. All the greats came through, Johnny Griffin, Dexter Gordon, and um, they played most of the time with the local rhythm section, which was a great, they were great players. There's great players in Toronto, really, really are. Um, and so he would come quite a bit. And uh, so I used to go hear him with Larry. And, and we also had quite a few Lee Comets records. And um, we also I was involved in a festival called the Art of Jazz, where we brought him to do a concert with Kenny Wheeler. Um, so I got to know him a little bit more intimately then. But um, just most recently, it was just last year at Dizzy's we were playing. It was a heat wave. And McKeke was playing. And um, we were just, we just finished up our first set. And we were just leaving the bandstand. I was, I was sitting around the bandstand. I think I was pushing, hawking my, my wares, my CDs. And... Um, Somebody, this guy, little old guy went in with a baseball hat into the dressing room. And Larry saw, saw him going into the dressing room where all the girls were, uh, just off the bandstand. And he said, what's that guy going into the dressing room? I got I to gotta catch him. He's going in there where the girls are. <laughs> then he quickly beelined it back out of the door, no faster than he'd just gone in. He said, it's Lee Konitz. He's in, the, he's in the room with the girls. And I was like, really? <laughs> That's crazy. So... I went into the bedroom and, and there was Lee and he was looking, you know, kind of around at all the girls and the girls, you know, girls do, do not know Lee Collins. And um, I, of course, recognized him. I said, Lee, wow, this is, this is so great to see you. And he kind of was looking around and, and um, this story is pretty funny. But anyway, <laughs> you know, we're a pretty raucous, raucous band. It's pretty high energy Cuban rhythms and stuff. And he said, um, he said to me, wow. Oh, that drummer, she plays so loud. And I was like, well, yeah, it's Cuban music. And it's like, you know, it's really, that's, yeah, yeah. And that's how it is. He said, oh. And then he was still looking around. And he looked really hot. And I said, well, can I get you an iced tea or something? And he said, oh, that would be nice. So I we went and got him an iced tea and I came back. And and, um, and I said, um, John, I'm not sure if you remember me, but we presented you, you know, quite a few years ago in Toronto. And he didn't remember. But anyhow, he said that he said to me, um, was that you playing up there? And I said, yeah, it was. And he said, didn't sound like you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. He said, yeah, well, that was me. And he said, um, can I sit in? And I was like, whoa. Uh, knowing that's not really his thing, <laughs> what we're <laughs> doing. And I said, well, do you have your horn? And he said, no. Um, and I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to scat. I said, oh, okay, well, but Lee, you know, like, we're singing, the, 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 we're singing, and some of the stuff is in Spanish, and um, some of it is in, like, Yoruban dialect, you know, <laughs> and then he said, well, they must know Stella by Starlight, I said, they don't know Stella by Starlight, <laughs> I said, well, what about all the things you are, I said, no, they don't know all the things you are, well, what about, um, he mentioned a couple other tunes, I can't remember right now, I said, they don't know it. And he said, well, there must be something I can do. So I was rattling, rattling my brain. Like, what could he do? What could he do? Yeah. It's all original material. It's all original standard stimulated. And um, then I thought about this one piece, La Funica Maria, which is a dance song. And, and it's, it has this intro. And I thought, well, maybe you could try and do something. And I said, well, what, what are you going to do? And he, and I'm, he said, and it's a dance song. So it's a very traditional Cuban thing. But it was just in one kind of pedaled minor key. And he said, well, I'm going to go dooby 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 dooby. <laughs> 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 I don't think 
that's going to work. So I kind of panicked and I went out and I spoke to the manager and I said, I don't know what to do. You know, like he wants to sit in and he's like one of my musical heroes. And I, and I always try and make things work. If there's somebody to sit in, I always say, well, then, you know, something miraculous can happen. I'm, I'm, I'm very open to those kind of things. But he looked at me and he said, Jane, do you know we're live streaming tonight? And I went, oh, perfect. So then I went to Lee and I said, Lee, you know what? We're live streaming. This is going out over the internet. So I think it would be better if you were going to sit in that we rehearse something. And um, he said, well, I'll come back tomorrow. And uh, we didn't see him the next night. <laughs> anyway, that's, right. that's my most recent going story. But he just sat in the dressing room and we had iced tea and I was it's having so a gross. beer. And uh, and then and then the sweetest thing, if you go to our website, if you go to our if you go to our Facebook page, we put we posted something uh, just a few days ago after because uh, Larry said to him, you know, Lee is quite sweet. It's up there. It's up on our on our Facebook. He said, Lee, you know. What, what do you have to say about your chops? How are your chops feeling these days? And he looked at Larry and he said, kissable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, kissable. very that, amazing story. <laughs> I, I don't care what character, you know, like, I mean, that's, that's the thing I love about jazz musicians. Yeah. Some another, of these guys are so unique, you know, totally. one of a kind. And another story for your eventual autobiography or biography yeah. if it comes along thank you so much for uh for joining us uh tonight um uh, for everyone watching please go to janebunnett.com and uh go to her spotify and, and stream it buy the albums and when the world resumes its normal programming let's hope soon please see her live she tours around the world do not miss her when she comes to town uh, as you can see here she's an incredible presence um, through her instruments, she also tells great stories. She has the commanding uh, command of the facts, com a, a wonderful stage presence. It's a night of incredible music and incredible charm. Uh, thank you so much both to Jane and to Larry, the tech guy. I know he's the producer and an incredible musician, but yeah, Elvis Larry. the tech guy. Yeah, yeah, Larry. Um, so really a privilege and an honor to, uh, to have you on the broadcast, and you're welcome back anytime, Jane. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing, and we musicians love you. Thank you very much again. <laughs> thank you, thank everything. you. I want to give a you special thanks, my friend. I, I want to give a special shout out um, to the sound and tech team who help with every yeah. broadcast. Uh, Sandra and Camilo, yes. uh, check out their website, SoundWorksRecording.com. Um, and if you're an uh, artist that are looking, they're open for business too. So obviously their schedule got cleared out. So they work remotely. So if you need any audio services, check them out online. If you mention one of their dogs, um, Oreo or Maui, woof woof, you'll get a discount. So please make sure <laughs> to mention the dogs. And uh, I think that's it. We are going to be back. You know where? Right here from the kitchen, from the dining room table. Uh, tomorrow we have a double header, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, with Woo. Wendy and DB, some great uh, artists, children's artists. And then at night we have another saxophonist, Mindy A. Bear, will be performing. And then right we, have, yeah, we have upcoming shows with the great um, Regina Carter and Joey Alexander. So stay tuned every night. We're on 10 p.m. Wow. Eastern. And uh, see you soon. Stay safe, stay warm, stay home. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Kabir. Good night, Kabir.